going to read some verses from the third chapter in the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles, reading the third chapter from the first verse. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask arms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in arms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I have none. But such as I have, give I unto thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk, and he took him by the right hand, and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for arms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were all filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. But there is no question about the need to evangelize the world in the day in which we're living because there are more heathen living today than at any other period in history. But I'm not too sure that we can afford even to lay down our lives to spread the gospel which is not quite the gospel of the Bible. I have been reading and being very disturbed in reading of the New Testament church, not from any textbook of church history, but reading the Authentic account here from the Acts of the Apostles, and I'm amazed at the disparity between what we label as Christianity today and what Christianity really was in the days of the Apostles. We have to say that between us and them there's a great gulf fix. And you will be very dumb tonight if you think that we're evangelizing the world because we're not. And I'm very glad I'm not God, because if I were God, I'd blow the lights out and pull the blinds down and say, get out of existence, church of God, and the world as well. Because again, we're not evangelizing the world. The first reaction of the world to the coming of the Spirit of God was one of playful mockery. When those men tumbled out of the upper room, you remember that people just jerked their thumbs and said with a kind of sneer, they're drunk. Well, I want to tell you something. The church never does anything when it's sober. Anyhow, it's time he got drunk again. We need what Spinoza calls some God-intoxicated men. Uh, the first day of World War II, I was preaching in the... Uh, a crusade for the head Nazarene church in, in England, actually in Scotland. And as we came out of the service, they announced that war had been declared and that the city would be in darkness and everybody must carry a gas mask. And so as we went home from the church, the pastor said to me, now, I'm going to get a gas mask. One of the reasons, of course, they were free. And... Uh, he said, I have to go in this building here and you stand by this lamppost if you're not coming in. And I stood by the, the, the lamppost in the street. The city was in darkness. The streetcars were operating without lights. Automobiles had no lights. And it's a very eerie, weird kind of world we were living in. And an old streetcar rumbled up the street and a man got off it. He was well drunk. And he staggered on those rubber legs of his one way and another, and then as he, he, he was going to fall, he put his arms around the lamppost and me as well, because I wasn't even as heavy then as I am now. And then he sensed that I was standing by the post, and he backed off. 
And he said, who are you? Well, I said, my name's Leonard Rayville. Ah, he says, my name's Stanley McTavish. Can you sing? I said, no. Ah, oh, he said, I can. And he sang Maxwell, Tom Blaze, or Bonnie, where it early falls the dew. Though he said Jew, but that didn't matter. And, uh, <clears throat> and then when he'd sung, he rolled his sleeves up and he said, can you fight? And I said, no, no, I'm not in the fighting business. Who's your favorite? I told him who my father was. What country did I come from? I told him. And then he began to tell me a lot about his personal history. And then he put his hand in his pocket and he took out a, a handful of great big English coins, a handful of silver. And you can tell a Scotsman's drunk when he offers you all his money. <clears throat> and he offered me this great handful of silver and I said, no, thank you. Uh, he says, what kind of a man are you? You can't fight, you can't sing, you don't want to talk, you don't want money. Good mix. And he went up the street. Now, if I had seen that man the next morning at nine o'clock, instead of nine o'clock in the darkness, he wouldn't even have spoken to me. He was intoxicated, he had another spirit. It's true he got it out of a bottle, but he didn't alter the fact. You see, Paul draws an analogy, a parallel here. He says, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Because when a man is drunk, he's ready to fight. He'll fight a man twice his size. He's generous, he gives his money. He wants to talk, he wants to communicate. He's happy to tell you his pedigree. And because these men in the early church were drunk, they were ready to fight the good side of faith. They were ready to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. They were ready, if need be, to go to prison for Christ's sake. I think there is nothing more exciting that I have ever read in my life about the Word of God, outside of the Word of God, by reading the, the statement of what you might have thought was a very stuffy English clergyman by the name of Dr. J.D. Phillips, and when he made his first investigation of the early church, he did it by reading the Acts of the Apostles, and he did it by reading it from the original Greek, and those words began to leap off the, off the page and grab him by the throat and shake him and make him realize that a church of which he was a part was a very, 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 very distant relative to the church as it was originally conceived. As the brother the song leader put a little thought in my mind this morning, and consciously, I guess, he said, after all, the promise is to those who are far off. Well, God knows we're far enough from Pentecost tonight to need the Holy Ghost to come to us. We're far off. We're far off theologically. We're far off in the time sense. We're far off because we have denied so many truths of the Word of God. Now, listen to, to Philip. He begins to read the Acts of the Apostles. And this is what he says about the early church. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Before she became fat and short of breath by wealth. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Before she became muscle bound by over organization. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Where people did not sign articles of faith. But they acted in faith. And remember, faith is the only thing that is a fruit of the Spirit and a gift of the Spirit at the same time. But these people did not sign a particular Baptist doctrine or Pentecostal doctrine. They did not sign articles of faith. They acted in faith. These are people, he says, not saying prayers, but praying in the Holy Ghost. This is the church of Jesus Christ, not gathering together a, super, a group of intellectuals to study psychosomatic medicine, but they heal the faith. After all, when Jesus sent out the disciples before Pentecost. Now, I'm not trying to skip your theology, but if it's sick, it needs some help, and I'm prepared to help you anyhow. But you can't tell me a miracle that those men did after Pentecost that they didn't do before Pentecost. To, to, to list miracles and say, this is Pentecost is nonsense. It is not true. The men that staggered out of the upper room did not, N-O-T, did not get into trouble for speaking in tongues. They merely got ridiculed for that. They did not get into trouble even for healing the man at the beautiful gate of the temple, great as it was. They got into trouble when they had been tried by the hierarchy, the big shots there, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. 
It was a boldness of a minority group standing up against the establishment, anointed by the power of the Spirit. And when they saw the boldness in Peter's job, they were staggered and they were amazed. Now, this is a very simple but a very sublime story. Here is a man crouched at the gate of the temple. To me, he is a type of our modern, thick, very thick society. To me, it is an illustration of organized religion that passes him two or three times a day and can do nothing for him. After all, read the story. They carried this man every day from his home to the temple, temple to home again. Twice a day, he was carried twice a day. There are 365 days in a year on there. So he must have been carried, what, 730 times a year. And if you carried him for 10 years, and remember, it's so often in the Bible, it does tell you the age of men. It very seldom tells you the age of women. But it says a little later, this man was over 40 years of age on whom this miracle was wrought. And if he had been carried 7,000 times in 10 years, and then he had been carried 21,000 times in 30 years. He had been carried, but he'd never been cured. He had been helped, but he'd never been healed. He had received a word of greeting, but he had never received a word of power. Now, isn't it a very strange thing that Peter and John went to the temple at the hour of prayer? After all, the hour of prayer. Why should they go pray with that bunch of backsliders? Because nobody in the temple believed what Peter and John believed, and Peter and, and, and uh, Peter and John didn't believe what they believed, but they went up to the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And this man may be crippled, but he says, after all, this is Peter and John. They had a big revival yesterday. They must have got a stack of money like preachers usually do. And uh, uh, we've got a big handout. And so the man there that has been crippled all those years, he suddenly makes his need known, and uh, the, the, the Bible says he asks for an alms. Well, phonetically, that can get you into trouble. A teacher was uh, telling some children about the man that sat at the beautiful gate asking for alms. And the little girl said, why did he ask for alms when he needed legs? <clears throat> well, uh, I, I don't think he's any worse than most of us. I mean, we don't let the Lord talk to us and tell us our need. We go with our big shopping list and say, Lord, do this and do this and do this, and I want this and I want the other and I want something else. Here is a man crouched at the beautiful gate of the temple. Year after year, the priest, the high priest, had tossed him maybe a golden coin. And another priest had tossed him a silver coin. And then he looks on this man, Peter and John, and he says, uh, I, I, I need an arm. And Peter said, silver and gold, I have none. Now, I have argued sometimes, I don't argue anymore about theology, but sometimes I've argued with men who say, now look, you know, I believe in Acts 2, 4. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak with tongues. Right, that's good, it's in the Bible, let's accept it. And I believe that you must be filled with the Holy Ghost and you must speak with tongues if you're really filled with the Spirit of God. They're very insistent about this. And I say, well, now you can't take a text from its context or it's a pretext. If you deal with a text, you must deal with the context, what goes before it, what comes after it. Now, if you're going to clobber me with Acts 2, 4 and say that I must be filled with the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, I'm going to come back on you and say, yes, my friend, look, and this is what you have to do. You must have balls of fire on your head. You must have a rushing mighty wind in the room. And not only that, you must fulfill Acts 2, 44. And you know they don't even know that's there. Acts 2, 4 is they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongues. Acts 2, 44 is that they sold all their possessions and shared everything out. Did you do that when you got the Holy Ghost? Maybe we better have an altar call right now. They sold all their possessions. And they shared it out. And whatever share Peter and John got, they'd already got rid of it. For Peter is telling the truth, and he says, Silver and gold I have none, but, but such as I have give I... Now, you can only give what you've got. Most of us want to give God what we haven't got. You can only give God what you've got. And you can only give anybody else what you've got. And Peter says, silver and gold I have none, but such as I have give I unto thee. You see, here is a man and he's crouched to the beautiful gate of the temple. He needs a man. He needs a message. 
He needs a miracle. And what that vast system of religion with its stained glass windows and its ritual and its formality which was so elaborate, what that system could not do. And remember a little earlier when uh, Zacharias went down the aisle, he was uh, a priest of the Most High God of the course of Abia. There were 20,000 priests ministered in, the, in that temple in a year. And yet 20,000 priests and all the blood of bulls and Jewish altars slain and all the ritual and all their formality, spectacular as it may be, still left that poor man crippled and impotent and paralyzed at the gate of the temple. I say he needed a man. He needed a message. He needed a miracle. And he found the man and the message and the miracle in two penniless but very powerful preachers. Two men who were consecrated. They were cleansed. They were compassionate. They were committed. They could communicate. And Peter says, look on us. We don't usually say that. We say, now you look to Jesus. But, but Peter says, you look on us. And, and afterwards, when they wanted to put a halo upon his head and me, he said, look not upon us, as though by our power, our own holiness, we had made this man to walk. He isn't after any uh, halos that men can give him. He has received the greatest thing a man can receive this side of eternity. He has been filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And I say again to you tonight that I believe that one reason we do not have revival is because individually and collectively we're happy to live without it. That's why... We're like a man looking in a shop window and he sees a Rolls Royce there and he tags it and he says, boy, it's $28,000. I'd like it, but I can't afford it. The price is too high. I'm convinced that our modern method of trying to reach this world for God is the same as you putting me on a little rowing boat to a great big iceberg which is showing a mile of ice above the water and therefore seven miles of ice below the water and all you give me is one match and I'm going to strike that match in my little rowing boat and hold it at the side of that super iceberg and you expect me to melt an iceberg with my one match. Most of the Christianity we export to the mission field today isn't worth taking there, let me tell you that. I preached at the great Kerizal Missionary Conference in Japan. There were hundreds and hundreds of missionaries there. And it pleased God that night to come down by his spirit. The meeting began somewhere about seven and ended uh, at nine o'clock. Suddenly, men began to make confession. Missionaries began to make confession. They were still confessing at midnight. The next day, one of the best known missionaries in Japan came to me. And he said, Brother Ravenhill, I want to tell you something. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you know how long missionaries have been in Japan? I said, no. They have been in Japan 120 years. At the cost of millions of dollars. Americans are here. People are here from New Zealand, Australia, England. All kinds of missionary societies here. And they have been here for 120 years. Do you know what degree of success we have had? I said, no. He said, including the Roman Catholics, we have gained a half of 1% of the population of Japan in 120 years. A half of 1%. These men turn the world upside down. This man says, silver and gold, I have none. You see, the difference between the church that was and the church that is is this. They have nothing, but they possess all things. Now we have all things and possess nothing. We've got billions of dollars blanketing the world every weekend with radio programs. I went a very well-known uh, brother, not Billy Graham, but somebody on his staff was asked a while ago what he thought about the final third of this 20th century. He said, I believe that mass evangelism is going to play a greater part. We don't need mass evangelism, believe me. America is not going to ride to spiritual victory on the back of Billy Graham and all the others. If America is going to have Holy Ghost revival, it's going to be when the local church gets it and the fire spreads there to another church there and the Baptists and the Methodists and the answer is in the local church, not in the mass system.
Oh, if you'll only give us money, we can get on another radio station. Do you know there are only 400 million radio sets in the world and half of those are in America? The people in Africa can't even afford a loincloth. I've walked amongst the people there in India on the dusty roads. Why, man alive, they can't even afford a cup of coffee, never mind a radio set. Oh, but look, you want mass evangelism? Shall I tell you something? I'll tell you two things. Somebody will say, well, that fellow sour grapes, you see. He doesn't have an organization like Billy Graham, and he, he doesn't have uh, six to seven, eight million dollars like all that. That's not, the, that's not the problem. A man came to me a while ago, and he was a Texan, too. A big, fine-looking man, and he said, I read an article of yours, and I read it to somebody else, and uh, I, 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 I've come to make you an offer. Do you know so-and-so? And I said, no, and he went through a list of men who had anything from five to thirty million dollars each. And he said, we're prepared to buy you the largest tent in America, we're prepared to buy you a whole row of trucks, and you can have Ray Mills revivals on the side, and they'd be no good, because only God's revivals are any good anyhow. But anyhow, he was going to put Ray Mills revivals on the side, and uh, give me the largest, uh, and give me the largest uh, stipend, so that would be good. Billy gets 25,000 a year, so I would have got 30,000 at least. And he was going to do all this and give me the finest stage and the finest marquees and the finest singers and the finest gospel and everything else. And he said, we'll put you on the road and boy, you'll get it made here in America. Now, if he told me that when I first came out of college, I'd have taken it out. Because when I came out of college, Spurgeon had risen from the dead. <clears throat> and he was going to shake the world. And the only thing, he must have died somewhere on the tour because we never made it like that anyhow. And I said to this man, and now he said, this is an offer. Nobody else will get this offer. You'll have all these millions of dollars behind you. You can have TV and radio, and you can do this. And then I said, well, this is all very nice. Will you accept the offer? I said, yes, I will. Oh, he said, I said, wait a minute. He didn't let me finish. Yes, I will on one condition. What is the one condition? The one condition, I said, is that with this superlative outfit that you're going to buy me, you, you, you buy me the anointing of the Holy Spirit so I can fill that tent and go out and shake America for, America for God. Well, he said, we can't buy you an anointing. Well, then I said, I don't want your trucks and your trailers and all the other things you've got. Because what's the good of having a great big cathedral and all the other trimmings if you don't have the super, superior anointing of God? Now, I'm not jealous about these, what these are, but look, you set the dial on your radio Sunday, and maybe you're still in bed. And you need to remember what uh, the old C.D. Stud said, uh, uh, get up, get up for, uh, for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Uh, a lazy Sunday morning surely means harm and loss. The church of God is calling in duty, be not slack. You cannot fight the good fight while lying on your back. But anyhow... I suppose it's nice to lay in bed and, uh, and you hear a radio program. And he happens to be a man who runs the radio Bible class of America for Grand Rapids. And he reaches 20 million people with his broadcast. And you don't need to change the dial. All you do is get another cup of coffee. Billy Graham comes on. He reaches 30 million. And don't change it. Showers of blessing comes on from the Nazarenes and they reach 15 million. And don't change your dial because C.M. Ward is coming on with the Pentecostal aspects and he reaches another 15 million. And still leave the dial there and you hear something about uh, I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest while you're still in bed. And uh, you, you can sit another half hour later. And when that's gone, you can still leave the dial and you'll hear somebody come in like dear old Mr. Fuller or uh, old-fashioned revival hour. And you'll hear about ten men follow each other like that that are all saturating a saturated community and everybody wants the last buck out of you and all we're doing is, is feeding a jaded appetite of people who have had enough light and they won't walk in light and darkness has covered the earth and gross darkness covers the people. Do you know why? The one reason that these men were successful, they had a consuming passion for Jesus Christ and it made no difference where they went. You see, in this early church, they were so different. As I said, and not facetiously, in the early church, you had a bunch of men in the upper room agonizing, and now you have a bunch of women in the back room organizing. Then it was the fire of the Holy Ghost. Now it's the fire in the kitchen. Look, if Christianity isn't supernatural, it is not the Christianity of the Bible, and I don't care how successful it may be and how much money you can get and how many people you have in your church. 
Christianity is a super, Christianity is a supernatural religion. If it's not supernatural, then it must be superficial. The Christianity of uh, the New Testament was impressive. Ours is impoverished. The Christianity of the New Testament was apostolic. Ours is almost apostate. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they don't see our boldness, they see our calmness. The early church was remarkable for its fire and for its faith and for its fruit. The early church was a living church. Ours is a languishing church. The early church, they died for him. We won't even live for him. The early church was a very poor church. Silver and gold, I have none. And I was a little shocked, let me tell you this, because there's no good, good pulling punches, you know. If I hit the Methodist here tonight, you'll say amen, because you ain't Methodist. But I'm going to hit the Baptist right now and tell you I was amazed to discover that the Baptist here in the South yesterday paid, what was it, 45 million to buy the little league at baseball or something? God pity us. I wonder what promise they got from the Lord for that. Huh? In any case, they might have bought a big league. Who wants to be in a little league? Ah, this early church that had the breath of God on it, that had the fire of God on it, that had the faith of God in it, that had the fruit of God working every day. Again, I say, they were a living people and we're a languishing people. A friend of mine came from Japan last year. And in the course of speaking, I heard him only in one minute meeting, but he really upset me. Because before he left Japan, he went for a haircut. It would be cheaper than getting one in the States. The very courteous Japanese gentleman put a cloth round his neck and uh, got him into a right position. And then he said, uh, you, you Americana? He said, uh, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a Yankee. Ah, America very rich. America a very great country. So he went on. You businessman? No, I'm I'm a missionary. Ah, me missionary too. Oh, oh my friend said very quickly, but I'm a full time missionary. The man nearly clipped his ear off. He said, I'm a full time missionary. Oh, I, I thought you were a, a, a barber, a hairdresser. Ah, that is only on the side. I am a full-time missionary. I am consumed with a new religion philosophy of this area. What do you call it? Sodagaki? Oh, said the missionary, tell me about it. Well, my shop opened 9 o'clock this morning. My shop closed 5 o'clock tonight. I go home, I bathe, I eat. I go out at 7 o'clock. I take with me my, my religious books. I knock on doors. And I knock on doors from 7 o'clock at night until 2 o'clock in the morning. Because if you've been to Japan, you know, when you get outside of Tokyo, there, uh, uh, if a hut is only as big as this desk, it has a, a, a TV uh, a tenor on it. And they watch their programs and they're all in wrestling and all the other junk that people want. And he said, I go to doors and I knock on the door and I ask, may I go in? And I teach them. I teach them my philosophy. From seven every night until two in the morning. At two o'clock I go home. I usually get home by, uh, by two o'clock. And then from two o'clock to four, I spend in prayer. Before my God, to renew my strength. And then at four o'clock I go to bed until half past seven. My friend was more than shaken when he heard this because he was a missionary and he sure wasn't living a bad place. And he said to the man, How long have you done this? Ah, he said, Six years. For six years. 
I go to bed in the morning at four. I get up half past ten. I have never felt fitter and stronger. But you see, I draw strength from my God. I have been pouring out my life for my God. And I renew my strength from my God. And then I go out. And, and, and this gospel, as we call it, is spreading. They have guaranteed, one of the leaders says, we will put Christianity out of Japan in the next ten years. It's taken a hundred and ten years to get one half of one percent of the people of Japan into a nominal concept of religion. The Christian religion. Now tell me this. Are the things that you are living for worth Christ dying for? We're living in a crippled society. They're crowded to the very gates of our churches wherever we go, whatever denomination we have. Here are people and here they are, paralyzed morally, spiritually, in every other way, impotent. They've given up unorganized religion. They've done as a boy I told you about the other day said, I live in a plastic society with a... With, with, with a uh, uh, the, the church is a ghetto, a stained glass ghetto where people just go and they have their fun. And the soldier said, all we do is sanctify it. We have our little happy time and we just pray over it and think it's wonderful. We used to go to the supper club and now we have suppers down in the, in the, in, in the basement. Not the upper room, the supper room. Not the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire in the kitchen. Not a whole, holy zeal that consumes us. Peter and John go to the temple at the hour of prayer and they know when they go that they have, they have no purse, but they have power. They have no prestige, but they have power. They're up against the tremendous system of the day, I say again, the Roman Empire with all its power, the Grecians with all their learning, and the Jews that felt they had a monopoly on God, and here are a couple of penniless but not powerless preachers. And when they see that man, he immediately, he asks for arms, Peter looks upon him. But you must not do more than look upon him. One of the amazing things is, God bless our dear brother going to Australia. I've been in Australia. Central Australia, it's 140 degrees. But remember this, will you, that when you get to Australia, you think you're in New York. You've got superior hotels, you've got TV, you've got automobiles, you can charter your private planes, you can run in your automobiles. And around the edge of Australia, it's 1969, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. But if you fly in a jet for two hours into the centre of Australia, where you see those great big black people with shiny skins, it isn't 1969, Anno Domini, it's 1969 BC. They're living 2,000 years nearly at the other side of the cross, while Christians in Melbourne and Adelaide and Perth and, and all the other areas sit at ease in Zion. And the strange thing is, you get a man here burdened for Australia, and you get people in Australia burdened for, for three quarters of a million Indians in America that nobody bothers to reach hardly. And if you want to see uh, uncivilized people go to the west of Canada there, where uh, just a few months ago they had about six murders in about four, four, four or five days. And those Indians are as wild as any film you've ever seen. And there are areas up there in the frozen snows, if you like to go there, where it's perpetually white. And there are people there in the, in the cold chill of unbelief and of sin. I say again, we have more people without God and without hope tonight than any, any uh, period in history. And I'm convinced in my own heart that the church that is is not the church for which Jesus Christ died. It would do as good as we cancelled every crusade, every gospel crusade in America for a year. I think what we need to do is evangelize the evangelists. And counsel the counselors and teach the teachers. And call the whole church to prayer and put a notice outside of your church, course for spiritual repairs. Or if you like to do it like a man did in America over a century ago, he put a notice outside of his church. This church will have revival or a funeral. He put himself on the altar literally. He had revival. When Peter saw this man crouched to the gate, he remembered the exceeding great and precious promises of God. And when the people brought him to question afterwards, you remember what he said? He said, well, uh, uh, this is that which was spoken by the prophet. 
And then he says, uh, for therefore being at the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he shed forth this which you have both seen and heard. I say again, nobody ever goes to sleep in a meeting where the Holy Ghost is. And Jesus Christ gave us a full work of redemption because humanity is cursed, not merely physically and mentally and in its spirit, it's totally cursed, and therefore Jesus gave us a, a full redemption. Now Peter isn't afraid of the status quo, and when he sees this crippled man, I say he not only looks at him, but he puts forth his hand and he touches him. You remember about six, oh no, it's ten years now since little shrimpy David Wilkerson as he was then, he's getting fatter and more prosperous, but then he was thin and skeleton-like, and he went into New York and challenged the, the, the system of iniquity there. And then out came the book, The Cross and the Switchblade. And almost as soon as it came out, Vincent Peale got a copy of it and read it, and he went back to his stately church there. The church where Nixon has been going until he was president, and lots of socialites go in New York, and uh, when the people got to church that Sunday morning, he roasted them. He said, I've got people sitting on these pews here, and all you've done for 25 years is polish that pew with the seat of your britches. You've never witnessed to anybody, you've done nothing. And he said, here's my stately church in New York, and we're not known for soul winning, and we're not known for rescuing the perishing, and our streets are flooded with immorality and drunkenness and profanity, and, and, and girls who are lesbians and bisexuals and homosexuals, and the, the whole brood of hell has come upon us, and a little boy comes from the country and challenges New York, in God's name, what are you doing in my church? And he didn't get too many smiles when uh, they went out of church that Sunday morning. Not many people said to him, you're the greatest preacher in America that Sunday morning. And they went to church next Sunday morning breathing a sigh of relief because he has a habit of blowing his top about every six months. And do you know what he did? He blew his top the second Sunday morning. And all oh, were they distressed and were they upset. And I had the privilege of preaching one night in that church at a banquet and my, the Lord really came and helped us there. You know that's true of so many, isn't it? As I said the other day, we're more concerned about people that live at the other side of the world than we are of people that live at the other side of the street. Now Peter says, silver and gold, I have them. You're asking for arms. I, I, I don't think really seriously you need arms. But he doesn't ask that impotent system of religion that he might be healed and made whole again. He knew they could do nothing. He'd been sitting there year after year after year. And maybe all people did in our languages take pictures of him or pass him a dime or talk to him in comfort. And then little Peter comes along and John, he says, fasten your eyes on us. The promise had been given, you shall receive power, the Holy Ghost coming upon you. And they came out of that upper room where God Almighty had been able to do his work in them. And he had cleansed them and he had endured them and they came out. Doesn't say much about their flashing personalities. All they were concerned about was they did not mis misrepresent that Jesus Christ who had died and risen again from the dead. And the Holy Ghost, you see, the Holy Ghost is totally, brethren, I believe in the total incapacity of the Holy Ghost to do anything that's normal. And I would say that you and I should button our lips before we say we're children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. What does the Holy Ghost do? It says that holy men of God spake as they were moved. Wherever the Holy Ghost is, there's movement. In the beginning, this world was a ball of clay shut up in the womb of the universe. And God spoke. And that big lump of clay came out. And then the Spirit of the living God brooded over the face of the water of creation. And when the spirit brooded out of chaos, you got cosmos. You got life coming out of darkness. You got life coming out of death. The spirit of God brooded. And then the Holy Spirit brooded on the dark chamber of a woman's womb and did another miracle. He conceived Jesus Christ. <laughs> the mothers don't like that. 
They say, after all, you, you, you don't really believe that a woman bore a son without having a, a, a human partner in that, 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 that God did some kind of supernatural thing, and the Holy Spirit came in the matrix of the virgin, sure. You see, I'm very simple. So I don't have problems some of you intellectuals have. Because years ago when I was praying, the Lord said this to me. He said, you know, son, I made the first Adam without a mother so I could make the last one without a father. It's just as simple as that. The Holy Spirit brooded in the beginning over chaos. The Holy Spirit brooded over a dark chamber, the matrix of the Virgin Mary, and conceived Jesus Christ. And then Jesus is put to death, and he's in a dark tomb. And as I said last night, the door has been shut. The stone is rolled over it, and there's wax over the stone, and seals over the wax, and soldiers there, and all the sin of the world there, and every demon in hell there. And do you know what it says? You say, Jesus says, I lay down my life the way to live. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost never work independently. They always cooperate. The work of the Son was to glorify the Father. The work of the Spirit is to glorify the Son, not glorify the preacher. I don't care how many gifts of the Spirit you have. I don't care how many miracles you have. The Holy Ghost never came to indulge you to make you a somebody and put a halo on your head and make you strut around and think you're somebody. No, sir, the work of the Holy Ghost is a very serious work. The Son glorified the Father, the Holy Ghost glorifies the Son, and the Church glorifies the Holy Ghost and the Son and the Father. And Jesus is lying there cold, and all hell is looking up. And everybody's run away and quit. And the Word of God says in Romans 8, the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead... The Holy Ghost can't do anything small. He made this world vast and wonderful as it is. He can see Jesus Christ. How do you get eternity into humanity? How is that one, the heaven of heavens, can it contain? How do you press him into the matrix of the Virgin, uh, uh, the Virgin Mary? How does the ancient of days become the infant of time? I don't know. It's a miracle of the Holy Ghost, but he did it. And then the Holy Ghost that brooded in the beginning, and the Holy Ghost that brooded over the Virgin Mary, and the Holy Ghost that raised him from the dead, found a bunch of nervous men in the upper room. And they were there for fear of the Jews, and suddenly there was a rushing mighty wind. You know, the Holy Ghost is likened in the Bible to a dove, but he did not come as a dove on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost is likened to water, but he did not come as water on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost is likened to the anointing oil, but he did not come as oil on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came in symbol of the two most potent forces in nature. For what is more devastating than a hurricane? And the Holy Ghost came as wind and fire, and they're terrible when you put them together, they're irresistible. I wish you Baptists were as insistent on the baptism with the Holy Ghost and fire as you are with water. Boy, you'd have shaken the world by now. Because somebody has wildfire, we settle for no fire and the world goes to hellfire. Brother, if God could only get that intellect of yours and a bit more of the Holy Ghost on it, and maybe more of the Apostle Paul than Mr. Peel. Well, I think Peel is appalling and Paul is appealing, but... Uh, I, I think if, it, if the Spirit of God could really get on that intellect of yours, brother, you might shake that community for God. The Spirit not only brooded over the beginning, he not only brooded over the Virgin Mary, he not only raised those from the dead, but he, he came there to those men in the upper room. And you know, a drowning man will catch at a straw. It's getting terribly late. We're going to have to have revival soon. America can't rot at the rate she's rotting. Unless one of two things happens, there's a divine intervention of God's mercy in revival, or we have another bloody war that will shatter us. I'm hanging on to a simple word at the end of uh, the uh, book of Malachi. Where it says, the Lord whom ye seek. And friends, I want to tell you tonight, though I've talked about revival, I've preached about it around the world, I've written books on it, but I want to tell you that revival in itself is no novelty. It is not revival we need, it's God we need. The Lord whom ye seek. Do you know why you came to an altar and got nothing? You were seeking a blessing, not the Holy Ghost. Not a person, maybe a gift, maybe an endowment. 
For the Bible says the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly, I like that word, the angels were keeping watch over their flocks by night and suddenly there was a sound of a heavenly host. They had been waiting in the upper room day after day and getting a little disturbed that nothing happened. And suddenly there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. On a Wednesday, the 23rd of August, 1727, away there at home, hut in Germany, a group of people were waiting. And just as the clock moved up to 11 o'clock, just as sure as that clock was going to strike 11, the heavens opened and the Holy Ghost came down. And we had the birth of the greatest revival, maybe that we've ever had, the Moravian revival. Do you know what the main feature of that revival was in my judgment? That when the Holy Ghost came on that community at 11 o'clock on that Wednesday morning, the 13th of August, 1777, a prayer meeting was born at 11 o'clock that morning that was still going on 100 years from the morning the Holy Ghost came. It's the longest prayer meeting recorded in history. In that community, you can go into the prayer chapel at midday and find half a dozen people praying. You can go at midnight and find half a dozen children at eight and ten years of age praying. You can go some mornings at two o'clock and find two or three wizened up old men praying. You can go at any hour in the day for over 100 years. That prayer room was never empty. And when the Holy Ghost comes, he moves, he moves, he moves. He moves over those people. They moved out to the ends of the earth. Do you know what happened? They fought very long. They had more missionaries on the mission field than they had people on their church roll. Isn't that something? I don't know why that's ever happened in history that there. But you see, the Lord suddenly came to his temple. And I looked for the Holy Ghost to come in a meeting like this one night. You know, with all due respect, if people knew that Billy Graham was uh, coming here tonight, y y you'd have them sitting out there by the thousand. But you know, one night the Holy Ghost is going to come. And some people had wished that God had made it to the conference that night, and they'll have missed it. He's going to come suddenly to his temple. He's going to say to you, brother, silver and gold you have not, but you can't say such as I have, did I unto thee? You see, it's a great joy to have nothing, because if you have nothing, you can't lose anything. If you have no opinion of yourself, nobody will ever make you cry because they hurt your feelings, because you have no opinion of yourself anyhow. If you have no pride, all the preaching in the world won't bring conviction because God has cleansed you in that area. You know, one of the great things about being dead is nobody else can kill you. If you really died in your spiritual life, died to public opinion, died to every... It doesn't make any, any difference what people say. You're, you're dead. Dead to the world and all its toys, its idle pomps and fading joys. By the same token, if you're broken, nobody else can break you. If you have nothing, you can't lose it. And so there's a great joy in having nothing, but there's a great peril in having nothing. You remember a man... Knocked at the door one night, and the fellow upstairs says, uh, what do you want? He said, I, uh, I need help. I need hospitality. I need a meal. Who are you? I'm so-and-so. You remember when you were in a jam at a certain place? Yes, I remember that. Well, uh, you said to me, any time of the day or night, you don't worry about it, just come to my house, and I'll give you the most gracious hospitality. Oh, I remember that. And the man says to his wife, Hey, come on, get up. I know it's two o'clock in the morning and it's a cold morning, but let's get up and make a meal. And uh, my friend has come. You know, the man that once found me in distress. And he's come and he, uh, he, he needs help. Now, let's get... And, and, and she says, Do you know, I don't have a loaf of bread. All the groceries are done. I was going for groceries tomorrow and brother, we're in a mess. And he says to his friend, Come in. And then he rushes down the street and he says, Hey, hey, come on, give me bread. And the man says, I'm not opening my store at this hour. He says, Come, because a friend of mine has come and, uh, I, I, and I've nothing to set before him. I wonder how often we have given an audience stones when they needed bread. I wonder how often we uh, should have given them uh, an egg and we gave them a scorpion. I wonder how often we dish something up that didn't matter too much and they take it because my people are so naive. Oh, no, 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 no. 
The man Peter had been so nervous and so full of fear and failure, now he's able to go to a man wrinkled at the beautiful gate, and he's able to put forth his hand and touch him, and he says, Hey, come on. I'll give you something. And he touched the man, and immediately he touched him, his ankle bones, and he stood up and he leaped and he praised God. Now it was this that set the community on fire. It was this that caused them to be brought before the hierarchy. Because in the next chapter they dragged them up there, you remember, and when they see these amazing men, they didn't wear any clerical attire. They possibly hadn't got a diploma between them. But oh, brother, they had something we don't have. We have so much they didn't have. They didn't have the freedom to preach the gospel that we have. They were up against hostility the whole time. I say again, it seems to me they have nothing and yet they possess all things. Now we have all things. We have more Bibles in America than ever we've had in our history. We have more books on the Holy Ghost than ever we've had in our history. We have more Bible schools than ever we've had in our history. We have more Bible conferences than ever we've had in our history. But somehow, we don't get any ignition. We don't get any fire there that burns. And so what do we do? We go back to the old settled ways that we had when we came and uh, just feel it was nice maybe to meet one or two folk. But you see, Peter and John had gone through that process with the Spirit there in the upper room and when they came out, they were full of faith and they were full of fire and the result, they bore fruit to the glory of God. And they could say to that crippled world, such as I have, give I unto thee. There's no guesswork about it. He doesn't say, I'll find somebody who knows this. But he has gone through an experience, and a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. I know in whom I have believed, he did this miracle in me. I think the pastor said, or Brother Jimmy said yeah, last night, that he didn't remember any great evangelist who was a Baptist. Well, of course, he was excluding Billy Graham. But one of the greatest evangelists we ever had in England oh, well, was a Baptist minister. And man, he shook the whole of one section of England under the power of God. And you know, he was a successful preacher before he did that. But there came a day when he recognized this, that there was restriction in his life and the Holy Ghost didn't have all the way that he wanted in his life. There were certain areas that he dare not surrender. You know, one of the great monsters of our day is the fear of man. We're afraid to be put out of the synagogue. We're afraid lest we get a new endowment and somebody thinks we've gone Pentecost or gone something else. It doesn't make any difference. Look, brother, there's a crippled world at the door of your church. What's happened in the last five years or the last year since you were here? There are kids getting lost in immorality and drunkenness, vice, all the horrible things that sex is producing and all the drugs that we have in these days. And yet again, it seems to me the church stands on one side impotent and she can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. There was a day when Thomas Aquinas often called the greatest theologian that the Church of Rome ever had, and he was watching them pour tribute money down a chute in the Vatican to be stored up. And the Pope turned round to him with a smile and said, Thomas, Peter can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. And Thomas Aquinas shot back and said to the Pope, Know your holiness. And neither can he say, such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I was preaching in a church away in Perth a few years ago, Perth, Scotland. And, no, it was not, it was Dundee. And it was a Saturday afternoon rally, and I'm not too fond of afternoon rallies, really, and... I went along just uh, to be a companion to the preacher and we went up in the train. It was a cold day. I remember the River Tay was frozen, great blocks of ice on it. And there was no heat in the train and we huddled up as best we could there to try and keep warm. And as we approached the church, there was a big sign outside. And on that sign it said, uh, so and so, so and so, so and so will be preaching the anniversary service on Saturday afternoon at three o'clock. And as we went in, I said to my friend, uh, he wasn't very tall, and I said, uh, you know, uh, those letters seem to me nearly as big as you are. This is a great announcement that you're going to preach, and he's a great singer who's going to sing. And he said, you know, Len, I'm not going to preach at all. I said, well, who is? He said, you are. 
Well, I said, I never knew that, but he said, well, I didn't feel now, but I feel you should preach. And I said, well, I don't feel I should. And we walked in, and they sang the hymns, and he said, now I'm going to sing a solo for you, and then Brother Raven is going to preach. And that was the next intimation I had, and I was really caught out. Side two. And then let God have the ashes. God will do more out of the ashes than you can do with a whole personality. And as I finished, I said, now, just bow your heads in prayer. We have five minutes to get off this platform and catch the train. It was just round the corner, and we're going back to Perth. But I want to pray for some of you, and I want to ask you, and so I said to them, if you, if you this afternoon will trust God to really fill you with the Holy Ghost, it's going to cost something. Because an experience of God that costs nothing is worth nothing, and it does nothing. But if you will let God Almighty have his way in your life, take all the hands off, let him consume all that you have. My brother sang that song the other day, I will praise him, but the last time that you remember, when God's fire upon the altar of my heart was set aflame, my ambitions, plans, and wishes at my feet in ashes lay. If you let God do this, I'd like to pray for you. Raise your hand to begin to put up the hands. And I counted. I don't often do this, but I counted. There were 12, and I said, anyone else? A little woman up the back with red hair. And she kind of looked like this and went like that. And I said, good, I saw it. Just like this she did. Fifteen years after my wife and I went to a missionary rally in the heart of, uh, heart of Manchester, got in late and I had to sit on the back pew. It was a great auditorium. It was packed. Here were these mysteries telling of the wonders of God. Well, I thought that's what they were going to do, but that wasn't till the night meeting, and they had a fellow preach in the afternoon, and he just got nowhere fast. And I think he was so conscious he got there so fast, he sat down, and the chairman said, now we have a little time before tea, would you like to hear a testimony? And so nodded, and he said to a little woman here, she was sitting on a chair, and her legs didn't even touch the floor, and she was kicking her feet like this. I thought she was like to have kicked the preacher, but she couldn't reach him. But anyhow, she said, shaking her feet. And, and he said, I'm going to ask Stone so to testify. And she got up, jumped off the chair, hit the floor, hit the desk. And in two minutes, she had that sleepy audience all sitting up and listening and eating out of her hand. Oh, she radiated God. Man, she said, I want to tell you that for years as a Christian, I had no victory, I had, no, I had nothing to give. I had no power, I had no prayer, I had no passion, I had no purpose. And I used to read books and think, well, well any anointing is only for distinguished people or preachers or missionaries or somebody. And every time I heard somebody say, come on, young person, you're not too young. Come on, you lay your all at the altar and let God cleanse you and fill you with the Holy Ghost and let him have the ashes and do as he will. He works a new creation. He said, the devil would say to me, now, of course, he means everybody here, but you, after all, what do you do? You work in a factory, and you put the brush around, just, just, just cleaning the dirt up. You don't have enough skill even to work on a machine. And she said, I swallowed that lie of the devil. But she said, one afternoon, I was away in Dundee. And I thought to myself, oh, I've been in Dundee. I know Dundee, all right. I was in the charity mission. Oh, oh, yeah, I remember being in the charity mission. I went to hear James Baxter McLaggen. Funny, I remember that meeting. And Mr. Raisner spoke. Oh, oh, this is interesting. And he said at the end, if you come to the altar and get on, and what is the altar for? The altar in the Old Testament is one for one thing and only one thing. It isn't for you to come and get a repair job done. It isn't for you to come and get an emotional bath. The altar is for one thing, it's to die on. And if you don't want to die on, don't come. He said, I went to the altar that afternoon because he said, God can do more with the ashes. And she said, all right, Lord, you never had a bigger job on your hands than you have with me. I didn't even finish my schooling. I can't even write a decent letter. And she said at the altar, I said, Lord, burn it all up. My pride, my weakness, my failure, my timidity. Take away the things that hinder and give me what I don't have. Give me power, give me passion, give me pride, give me purpose. I don't care how long I live, it's how I live that matters. And he said, Mr. Raymond said, 12 have raised the hand, who's the 13th? And he said, you won't be unlucky. And she said, I wasn't. 
And now I remember saying, now look, 13 people raised their hands, I, I, I have about four, three minutes to get to that train, and so you hit the trail down here uh, as we see the spirit of the living God fall afresh on me. Hurry and get out. And you know, as I, I, I turned to go off the stage, I looked, and this little woman with the red hair, she went down that hall so fast, I'm sure she's the first person in history that did a mile under four minutes. She really went down like a squeak and went into that back room. And 15 years after, she's in a missionary conference. And she said, you know, that day when God met me, I, 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 I didn't know much English. It was my worst subject. I couldn't write a letter. But she said, once the Holy Ghost came and took my fear and took my weakness, he took away the fear of man, he took away the fear of the future, he took away the fear of everything, and he came because the Spirit of God, God hath not given us the Spirit of fear, but the Spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. And he gave me purpose and he gave me passion and he gave me a program. And he said, when I get home, I applied to a Bible school. And they took me. And she said, you know... When I graduated in that Bible school, I was the dumbest child that went into it. When I came out, I was with the top few right at the top there. And then I went to the School of Linguistics in Paris. I couldn't even speak good English, but the Lord uh, did something, you know, uh, as it says in Romans 12, that he doesn't really renew your body, but by the renewing of your mind, your intellect. She got a baptism on her intellect. It became alive. And she became proficient in English. She could write beautifully. She became proficient in France. And, and in French. And when she graduated, she graduated way at the top of the ladder there. Dumbness she would be. And she said, you know, when I was in Dundee, I wouldn't go out in the dark at night. I, I, and I was very nervous. I, 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 I never talked to men if I could help it. And I'd certainly never talk to a man in the dark. And when I went to bed at night... You know, religiously like these most of spinster ladies do, the first thing she did was look under the bed. And uh, <coughs> she looked to see if there's anybody waiting to steal her. They're very precious, these ladies. And uh, she looked under the bed, and then she made sure the windows were locked, and then she made sure the door was locked, and then she said, now I lay me down to sleep. I'm sure the Lord will take care of me because we've got six bolts and bars and all the other things, and I'm all right. I was so nervous. And she said with a smile, you know, I'm not afraid of the dark anymore. I live right in the heart of the bush, and I just have a little house made of bamboo, and I have leaves on the door, and some night she says, I wake up and I hear something going... <coughs> but she said, you know, when I was working in that factory, a mouse would run over the floor, and I'd jump up and chair and scream. As though a mouse could knock a woman over weighing 110 pounds. But anyhow, she's terrified of the mouse. She said, now I wake up in the night and I hear something at the door and it, it, it's a lion or a, or, a, or a tiger or a panther wanting to get in. And she said, I just turn over and say, sorry, I'm not on the menu tonight. And uh, <coughs> I, I, I just go to sleep. And then about two o'clock, somebody knocks at the door and uh, I go there and there's a towering black man. He says, Missy, my wife, there you, my wife, very sick. I come here five miles, please, because my wife having baby, my wife died. And she says, just wait till I light my lamp. She says, I put a wrap on me and tie myself up and get my lamp. And we go to a river and the only way you can cross it is a, is a, a log that isn't too straight and it's all slimy. And, and the black man says, now you, Missy, you give me your lamp. I hold two lamps, you walk behind me. And he walks on there, slipping and uh, it's slippy and she said, and, and as he goes, there's a big thing there. It's only got one cavity, but boy, that cavity could take anybody. And there it is with its mouth open, welcome, says the hippopotamus, and the little lady, welcome, says the crocodile. And she said, I just go singing, blessed assurance, oh, what a forte, all is at rest, I in my stage, and I'm happy and blessed. And then she says, I get a little further on, so I go, woo! And the fellow says, well, uh, you, you, you're all right, that's a, that's a lion, he's killed about ten people, but I'm sure we can make it. And she said, I deliver the baby, and I stay with a woman that's terribly sick. And then he says, I'd better see you back home. And she says, no, you don't need to go. I, I, I've got another person with me. In fact, he's not only with me, he's in me. And she said, that's the reason. And she said, you know, the little helpless girl that used to sweep the floor of a factory here, uh, up there in Dundee, has been working on the mission field now, and God has not only revolutionized their life and revolutionized it psychologically and intellectually, 
I'm not only happy with my language, I'm not only happy with my learning, but she said the Holy Ghost did a miracle in me, and then he did a miracle through me, because in that part of Africa we have been having revival. And she said, I want to take you right back to where I started. It all happened when I went to the altar and said, Lord, let the fire fall. Let the fire consume all my weakness and all my fears. And take the answers and do with them just as you will. I preached in a little tin church away there in Belfast. And as the preacher said, Brother Raymond was going to speak, I, I just looked up behind before I got to the desk. There's a picture of a very charming Irish lady. She's very frail. She had a curvature of the spine. She went out to India and founded the Donovan Fellowship. And you've read her books, I guess, Amy Wilson Carmichael. You know, the last three years of her life, they had to lift her in and out of bed, but... You see, you can't make bread unless you put the corn through the mill. You can't have wine unless you crush the grapes. Many of us want to be a blessing, but the word, there's only one way to be blessed. There are two things that God demands that you're going to be a blessing. First, you'd be broken, and the second thing, you bleed. And you can't be a blessing unless you'll be broken, unless you bleed. And she went out and founded the Donovan Fellowship. And she wrote some of the most wonderful hymns that we have in our modern hymnology. And she wrote a thing that goes like this, Give me a love that leads the way. A faith which nothing can dismay, a hope, no disappointment, tire, a passion that will burn like fire. Let me not think to be a clod. Make me thy pure flame of God. A little woman with a tail into the spine that got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little neglected kids. Some of them pulled out of the gutters. Some of them were being put there for the crocodile street. And she started a rescue mission. And there are hundreds of people now in good positions in India that rise up and call that little Irish girl blessed because despite the thing that God never healed. Because you see, sometimes God can get more out of a broken life than a whole one. Some of us are too sick to be much good for God. We'll have to come and do a little breaking in us somewhere. And Amy Wilson Carmichael took that frail body of hers and said to God, here it is on the altar. Do you hear the language? Isn't it extravagant? Give me a love that leads the way. Supposing God has his finger on a man here tonight, why not? With all due respect, the modern dream that evangelists haven't done too much. We have conferences for evangelism, but nobody ever thinks of having one for revival. I'd like to see somebody call three or four or five hundred ministers from any denominations together for about two weeks together and get them behind closed doors and let them talk like men and let them pray like men and let them express their failure and let them call on God. Have you a love tonight, my friend, that leads the way? What have you to give to your generation? What have you to give in your school teenager? Have you a testimony that vibrates with reality? What have you to give to your community preacher? Love, compassion, concern? Maybe we should pray this prayer tonight. Give me a love that leads the way. A faith which nothing can dismay. A hope, no disappointment, fire, a passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sing to be a cloud. Make me thy pure flame of God. And I finish with this little verse of the man that set the world afire just a hundred years ago, William Boo, half Jew, half Gentile, founder of the Salvation Army. You remember he wrote, Thou Christ of burning, cleansing flame, send the fire. Thy blood bought gift today we claim, send the fire, look down and see this waiting host with us the promised Holy Ghost. We want another Pentecost. I'm not sure whether we want it, brethren, but we need it very badly. I guess if I could talk with you face to face over a table, Pastor, you would say to me, my church, though it's a fundamental church, is one of the neediest churches in America tonight. I've got elders, but they have no fire. I've got people, they have no faith. I've got people that have no passion. I've got people that have no purpose. I've got people that cannot pray. And because they do not pray, they have no passion. Because they have no passion, they have no purpose. 
You know, in the economy of God, when the Holy Ghost comes, as Tozer said, no man ever was filled with the Holy Ghost without knowing it. If he gives you tongues, that's your business. If he gives you something else, that's it. But I tell you this, that when the Holy Ghost comes, you'll know it. For after all, if a man is dead in trespasses and in sin, and he can be born again and know it, then a man who is already born again should come into a new experience with God, will know that he's passed into this new experience. I say, as I said last night, I believe there are enough people here, sincere and dedicated to the degree they know already, there are enough if we could really lay out all on the altar. And you come to the place where you really want to die, and we take the full total responsibility of your personality for your spirit and your soul and your body and your mind and your faculty and your will. If we could get to that place, this, this meeting could make history for America. It could not only make history for America, it could make history for this generation in which we live. You know, I was 14 and a half years of age when God saved me. I never doubted it. And two or three years after, Jesus told it what you like, but I knew there were things wrong in my life, and I remember going to an altar and meeting God, and I remember quoting, not Romans 6, 6, but Romans 6, 7, he that is dead is freed from sin, and asking God for a new work in life, and God did it. And somebody gave me a little cheap brochure, only about 20 pages, on the life of David Bernard, and I read it. And I didn't know God was still in the business of making men like that. I thought he quit when the Acts of the Apostles were finished. And I read about this young American. And John Wesley said about 25 years after Methodism had been born and it was slipping then, he said, give to his brother, get a copy for every minister in Methodism. Get him a copy of the prayer life of David Bernard. And I read it. And I started to go under the trees in the forest, Sherwood Forest in England. And when other boys played ball, I decided I would go pray. When other boys went to do other things, I decided I would go play. When I went to college and boys played football in the dinner hour, I decided to go play. And I got a book by another American, Ian Bounds, and I read that. And I'm not saying I'm anything or anybody, but I thank God for that time. And I made up my mind as a teenager, as a youngster, from here out, God has this life of mine to do as he will. He's looking for others tonight, looking for other teenagers, young men, young women, and older people. Many of the people that will sell out completely, that will come to an altar to die and say, burn me up and take the ashes and do as you will. And when he does it, he'll write a new chapter in the history of his church. Silver and gold I have none, but such as I have I give. What are you giving? Are you giving faith in your church? Are you giving compassion in your church? Are you giving power in your church? Are you giving prayer in your church? Are you, have you passion for your church? Have you, have you purpose for your church? Or did God bring you here tonight in order that he might meet you afresh and give you what your life is lacking tonight? Not a blessing, but the blesser. Not gifts, but the giver. Not an experience, but the Holy Ghost to come and have full control of your personality. Shall we pray?